banana and bear's raw beef pod. Well, hello, everybody. This is the Banana and Bear podcast. And we are Banana and Bear Rugby podcast, even better. We, we've only been promising for about seven months. And we are now finally doing it. This is as simplistic as it sounds. We're going to do short little audio vignettes over the next couple of weeks coming to you just in case you're a fair weather fan, which would seem we've got a few people who are just kind of sticking their head around the door of rugby and having a look in going, is this any crack at all? Well, this explains it. It is actually a right bit of crack. And simply what we're going to do is kind of break it down into the simple and non-nerdy side of rugby so that at the very least, if you find yourself down the pub, you have some semblance of knowledge as to what's going on. So you don't look like an out and out bollocks when somebody is shouting for forward pass or high tackle or in crooked and all these different things. We'll give you the inside track. So at the very least, you can run into the toilet, have a quick listen of one of the audio, one of the audio episodes we put out and come back out with all the knowledge that is needed. Just enough. Just enough. You don't need to be up to coaching standards. Just enough. So in this episode of How to Rugby Rugby, we are going to explain on the grand scale what rugby actually is in case you've come from a cricketing background a football background or absolutely no sporting background whatsoever I'm going to use the knowledge of my partner in crime who is actually a top end rugby person and I'll ask her the simplistic questions that I think you'll need to know so this is how to rugby rugby with Anna and Tom Anna are you ready to rugby rugby? Yes. Fantastic. So I am. Are you asking me questions, isn't it? I think so. I think we. I, if I chime in with something that I think that people need to know, but realistically, I mean, you're at the coal face. You're still playing rugby at the top end. So, I mean, no, in all fairness. Handy though. Mm. That's handy, though, because I feel like there's things that, you know, you mightn't even think of that mm. are pretty obvious. Or, well, know. that's exactly it. And the idea is that, I mean, who better to ask than somebody's literally playing right now and coaching as well right now. So, and I mean, who, who are they going to believe? The guy with the handlebar moustache, moustache, who can't even say moustache, <laughs> who tells jokes at the weekends, or the person who's playing rugby. So, the simplistic side oh, of it. Oh, we know the answers now. Eric, come on, come on now. So, straight out the gate, uh, how many players on each team? Two teams obviously play each other. How many players on each team? In this version uh, that we usually cover, which is Rugby 15s, there are... 15 players on each side, uh, eight forwards, seven backs, and then you have uh, eight players on the bench. Uh, it used to be seven until not so long ago, and even before that, it used to be five or even three or one. But uh, current day substitutes means that there's eight people to, to bring onto the pitch uh, as well. So you have a squad of 23 players that uh, go to any game. Class and the length of a of a match at senior level, I suppose. Eighty minutes, forty minutes a half with a t usually a ten minute half. It depends on like television and stuff, but usually a ten minute uh, half time. And the clock is paused throughout, isn't it? So the, when you see eighty, it is eighty. It's not like in in Gaelic games yeah. where it could be seventy, it's but the the, the added minutes. None of that. The clock is paused when it's paused by the referee and whatnot. Um, yeah point actually uh so the, when the ref the referee will stop us to like talk to the players or if there's an injury or if there's i reckon at this world cup as well they're going to have water breaks every 20 minutes so that'll be another stoppage uh stoppage for substitutions and usually you'll hear the ref the ref does two sharp uh short sharp uh blast on his whistle to stop the clock he goes mm -hmm. doot, doot, time's off and that usually means to stop the clock so yeah when the clock goes red, you don't need to look for the little man on the side or the little woman on the side holding the board with the number of extra minutes. Like, that's <laughs> it. Yeah. It means that the players then as well, they know, like, there'll be a clock in the stadium or they can ask the ref so that they can kick it straight out. But you can't finish the game on a penalty. Um, yes, very well pointed out. Yeah, so if it's uh, if it's eighty minutes, or even at, at even if it's forty minutes, if there's a penalty, uh, the ref has to allow time to to have the the penalty be taken. So sometimes you know you'll see the clock go into like forty four minutes, forty five, or even eighty three, eighty four, eighty five. That would be exceptionally long. Mm. Um, but it gets very tense then because the next knock on or handling error or or a foot into touch um or accidental offside or, or some small error uh is the end of time then perfect well that le that leads perfectly into in the next subject of uh knock on and forward passes because you'll you'll hear that a lot um 
and people were kind of going, I don't know, what are you talking about? They're allowed to throw a forward in basketball. You know, you can kick it forward in, in, in any sports typically, but it's the forward passing and stuff. It is unlike American football. It is all lateral passing, isn't it? Yeah. So you can run forward and you can kick forward, but you have to pass backwards. And you'll see a lot of people like, you know, getting kind of, irate about a flat pass Mm -hmm. but if a ball is allowed to go like uh absolutely like if you're in line with the player you're passing to and it goes straight along the line to them that's that is allowed but it's marginal so you don't want to be pushing for that um a lot because you know a ref might give it or not and depending on a home crowd if they're shouting for you or against you they'll all be like forward pass when actually it was fine so what you need to do as a player if you're passing the ball you need to make sure you continue your run forward as well because if you pass the ball backwards and then you kind of fall back and you take a step backwards Mm -hmm. it might look like the ball has gone forwards then because the player who catches it will be ahead of you so it is important as a player that when you pass the ball you continue your own run forward as well much like uh, Bundy Aki's pass to Keith Earls during the England game it did look at but in all fairness, his hands were traveling backwards and the ball, it kind of came forward a bit, but it it left his hands backwards, you know, and like that, he kind of came to a stop too. It was marginal. You could, you could yeah. argue either one, but I don't think yeah, anybody Yeah, you was... could argue either one. And left his hands backwards is a weird, a weird way of looking at it and people mm. say that, but it's just a, it's just a way of getting out of giving a forward pass, I think. But a knock-on is one as well. So if you lose control of the ball in any way, you know that's why um refs and tmos will take forever like looking at clips of like the grounding of a ball sometimes because you need to be in control of the ball you know sometimes a player's elbow will be on it when they're scoring the try or their chest but like do they have control of the ball that's usually the question that they're asking so in the in the grounding um the grounding side of things so the scores so they, they, they it's different to, to rugby league and r- what it used to be but this I think was it six and one before was the way they used to do tries and, and conversions I think it was years and years ago I think it was six and one or was Changed. it four and, four and three it was I think four, four it was, that's uh, right four for a try as well but actually nowadays I think my brother said this to me years ago and I still haven't actually fully proved this but the only scores that you can't score in rugby are one two and four so yeah. you can't finish on those scores I think every other combo is possible um but anyway it's three points for a penalty kick or a drop goal kick um five points for a try and when you score the try you get a chance to convert the try which is an opportunity to f- add two more points so that's why you see you know the players run over the line mm-hmm. they try to get as close as they can to the posts to allow the kicker um, an easier kick to add two more points and sometimes like that's could be you know the stage of the game where it could mean winning or losing or getting a bonus point or whatever because um they'll be like really fighting to get towards the posts especially if it's a windy day especially if their kicker has gone off Do you know they'll be like really fighting like they don't want to go over in the corner they have to go over closer to the posts so because of course that the, the message kick, will be coming on the, the kick would be has, must be taken uh absolutely straight out from where it was touched down isn't it now you can go out as far as you like to, to increase to increase the angle for yourself or or better the angle for yourself but the ideal placement of scoring a try is directly under the centre of the post so that they have yeah. a better opportunity to get well, those two players will be aware of like which which foot is better for the kicker so if yes. they've got enough space and the time they'll put it where the, the, the kicker likes to kick from so you'll see them sometimes go directly under the post and sometimes directly under the post is a hard kick for like yeah. a right foot. So they'll go slightly to the left or slightly to the right of the post if they've got enough time and space to do that. Very good. So the, the other scoring then you said drop goal as well. Now explain that because you can't just boot the ball straight out of your hand uh, Gaelic football style. Sure you can't and straight over the posts. It won't It won't work that way. No. For In order to avail of the three points it has to bounce off the ground before you kick it. But that's not the same then for kicking to touch. So exactly. there's some there's some so a drop goal or a, a goal line dropout or a twenty-two dropout, it happens to, to reward your um team with that. But like there's only certain kicks allowed. But if you're just taking a normal penalty, if you're kicking at the posts, you'll kick from the tee. But if you're kicking for touch, you can just kick directly from your hand. 
because of course kicking for a touch when you've received a penalty for some infringement whether it's a high tackle or something of the like you can kick to the the sideline the touchline but in the modern rules you will then get the throw in which from that once upon a time you boot it out you boot it out but you will get the throw in from that so um we'll go into if the it's line- your penalty. if it's your penalty we and we'll go into the line out in another episode along with the scrum and stuff like that, just to kind of explain what what happens from then but the uh a lot of the time when I'm in the pub people get confused by the kicking from hand and it going straight out so will you explain that one so in a live yeah. live live play somebody lashes the ball with a kick but it yeah, goes straight out yeah. what's what's the I problem always, there Anna I always really like the referees are really on are really great to be following this because it comes from what's happened before the kick so then the ref will give the information. So let's say, so the 22 meter line, like everyone needs to learn where the 22 meter line is. It's a very important line for many reasons. Um, so Google it or uh, get out your get out your map and, and draw it up. But um, if you have a rock that's inside your 22 meter line, so, um, you know, you're defending, you've got the ball, there's a, a tackle and a break. So you've got a rock. You're back, you're close to your own try line, essentially. So you need to get out of there because there's no point chucking it around in there because if you if you make a mistake, then they're very close to your try line. So usually teams will kick out of here as much as possible. If they want a bit of a break, they'll usually kick for touch or if they need to reset and kind of get their head together. So if the rock has been inside the 22, um, that's that means the kicker kick straight out over the touchline and that's Doesn't where the to line out will be. can just boot no. fly straight out into rose head no problems yeah absolutely however if your the rock is outside the 22 the kicker cannot kick straight to touch if they do you'll see the 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 touch judge running back to where the ball was kicked from yes so the, and the referee will tell you like that's outside, that's inside. So the referee will tell the kicker, because um, sometimes you know it could be very close to the line. So the the referee will usually make it very clear. Um, if they do want to try to 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 get the line out anyway, it has to bounce before it goes out. Now I don't know if I've explained that right or not, but um, no, we'll, we'll we'll recap it because in all fairness, you have a lot you have a lot to add in there. So kicking from inside your 22 meter line you'll see the 22 much like American football you see 22 on a lot of the pitches now written literally written there on the, on the side so why is it called why is it the 22 from which from where is the 22 meters measured from it's 22 meters out from the try line there you go so you mu- that that is your zone you live inside there for a moment once you're inside there you give it if you do decide to kick to get yourself out of trouble because you're the opposition are pounding at you it must bounce or if you're inside it, you can boot it straight out and take a breather and you go for there, the opposition's line out. If you're outside it, as Anna said, and it happens, the referee will tell you you're outside. Or if you bloody well know you're outside and you're nearly up at the halfway, it must hop off the ground at least once. Then the new one that is invented, and this is just adding another string to the situation, the new yeah. scenario, and this will be tried a lot by the South Africans because a lot of them have big old boots on them, is the 50-22. Can you explain yeah. that one? So that's another kick. It is. It's actually such a good rule. I love Great. it. It's so but it was brought that players are defending the zone at the back, which mm-hmm. means that there's fewer players in the defensive line, meaning that there's more space. It'll allow teams to like run and attack a bit more. So basically making the game a little bit more exciting. Yeah. Because for a while there, there was just loads of kicking going on. Not enough rugby. So this rule, it's actually, it's really smart because it has changed how many players are in the defensive line um, and it has made it's a really exciting rule when it happens but also has made the game more exciting anyway so what it means is that uh, inside my 50 meter zone so when I'm like defending uh, from where my try line is that's my 50 meter zone from the 50 meter to the try line um, and when I say my try line I mean the one I'm defending not the one I'm yes. scoring into Um so players can kick from their hands and it's not actually that long, but the problem, the difficulty is around it that there, there's usually players back there. There's always so much it. cover now. Everybody's covering it now. Yeah, yeah. so much cover, yeah. So it has to bounce 
um, inside the pitch and then roll out over the touchline beyond the other team's 22. And if you manage to do that, then you get to win the line out. So you yes. basically win, you know, 30 or could be 40 meters of territory and you've got your own line out. It's an unbelievable rule. <laughs> it's a great rule. And it's, it's hard. A great... And we will be it's explaining. It's not, too, it's not too long of a kick, but it's just skillfully and like having your eyes open to having uh someone there defending it uh is is a is a good skill is the skill is the harder skill than the actual kick itself if you if you haven't if you, you're still kind of wondering the the insides of it go have a look at what ben healy did in his debut for scotland it is actually by itself up on his up on highlights on instagram and stuff it's it, it was a beautiful one he gave it he, his came like a rocket in real low so nobody could get to it it was a really crafty mm. one you'd have to bend down to get it so you couldn't keep your eye on it. It was really, really good thinking. We will explain the defense and the offense in in another episode. That'll be by itself, just so that you kind of have a grasp of where the hell people are standing and their roles and stuff like that. But so you can bring on the 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 full eight. You'll have seen people like South Africa bring. They had seven plus one on the other day, seven forwards. Normally it's a six two split or even a five three split, but they brought on. They had seven plus one of the little guys, you'll notice the forwards tend to be the big fellas, the big people, strong people, um, current people that could strangle you. Um, and then the the, the 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 lighter people, I suppose, because they have to do a hell of a lot more running. Um, they get kind of lighter as they go further out, don't they? Just to kind of give people, like you, by the time you get down to 15, Hugo Keenan, he's quite a light looking man, you know what I mean? But, mm. versus Tyg Furlong, the roles, there's a role there for everybody. That's the beautiful thing about rugby, isn't it? Yeah. That's always, uh, yeah, that's always the way, um, you know, rugby is sold to people. That's why people love rugby as well. And like everyone is it's for, so inclusive because of that reason, because of the different, uh, you know, roles and responsibilities of each player. So, or, or of each position, I should say. Um, so, yeah, that's that's true. But yeah, with, with the eight substitutes, the reason everyone was losing their minds the other day with Razzie, and South Africa making a 7-1 split, you, you wouldn't put so many forwards on the bench because you need cover for the backs as well. So you'd usually um, have, you know, maybe five forwards and then you'd see how players were going if to decide who what, who needs to come off to bring on fresh legs or, or, or whatever. Maybe you don't even bring them on. That happens sometimes too. But anyway, they've decided, like Razzie in South Africa, they've approached this very differently and, like, they've made it out that... If you're coming off the bench, you've got you are just as important, if not more of an important mm-hmm. player than the people who started. Because traditionally, you know, if you're if you want to be selected, you want to start, yeah. and then coming off the bench, you know, you feel like you're second best. You feel like you know that's kind of naturally, but uh, the feeling. But um, Razi has kind of changed that approach now, and I love that. I love like innovation and like crazy oh. r- ways of approaching things. So, so. Brilliant. We won't go too much further into it because there's, there's, we can, we can, uh, we can zone off what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks. But the last one I'd like to finish on is um, tackling and how it differs from other sport like Gaelic foot games. Again, you can throw your shoulder into somebody, which typically you won't. But it's just the likes of the high tackle and the no arms tackle and the chop tackle and stuff like that. So when people hear these terminology, that they'll know down the pub and uh, that they'll go, oh yeah. I'd say that was high. When would you explain like the the premise of maybe a couple of the different styles of tackles that people will hear shouted from the rafters inside yeah. the bar somewhere? Jeez, there's a there's a million ways to kind of uh to go about it, but all all I would say is that player who's making the tackle needs to wrap their arms, mm-hmm. um, and then keep away from shoulder or higher. Perfect. And make it as simple as that. Because you know a lot of a lot of the kind of cards you're seeing now are happening at rock time of of players hitting rocks, and it looks like they're flying in with their shoulders, you know, their arms down, their shoulders going into heads, and it looks really dangerous. But if you, you know, if you've got your your arms up ready to to tackle, it looks like you're making the effort to like wrap up the person, which is you know that makes it the tackle safer to yes. wrap up the player. So you both fall together. So you have to the tackler has to wrap his arms. So that's why. You know, recently Owen Farrell and, and, you know, other players have gotten in trouble because it has just been a shoulder into a head and there has been no attempt to wrap their arms. So wrap your arms and keep away from shoulder or higher. Simple Perfect. Like 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's nothing more that needs to be said, really, other than yeah. I mean, the yeah, no, the odd people like talk like a chicken wing. I fucking hate that. It's like no, look what it, it's straight to its shoulder to the head. It's from as Anna said, they were talking about from the nipple line down and stuff. And you're like, well, whose nipples are where? How do I measure a man somebody's nipple? You're right from from the shoulders down. Okay. Sorry, the one other one, but we we haven't seen him in a long time. It was the spear tackle because it takes quite a bit of effort to spear tackle somebody, but it's exactly how it sounds. You pick somebody up and drive him into the ground like a lawn dart, essentially. We haven't seen one in a long time, thankfully. Um, although they do pop up every so often, like, but every so often, but they have been coached out of the game. Yes, but that was happening as well because players were standing up high making tackles, but you cannot stand up high to make a tackle because you will make contact with someone's head. Yeah, so that's you know. Uh, I we all we spoke about in a few, a few, a few episodes ago that like you know oh but the game's gone soft game's gone soft yeah because we've learned that players are having long term head damage yeah yes yeah game's gone soft is that what you want to call it then fine we can fair, yeah. call it that. so uh you cannot be standing up making a tackle because you will make contact with someone's head and even if that person is fine hopefully you could get a red card and a ban and, and, and like let your whole team down. So you have to bend to make your tackle, which means you have to practice your timing, make sure you're, you're not taking big steps into the tackle because then that's hard. You have to like take small steps, allow yourself to sink down to, to make sure that you're bending to make the tackle. Perfectly explained. So we will, uh, that's, I mean, that's it. That's that's rugby loosely explained. We'll go into the, the finer ones like rucks and malls and lineups and scrums and the roles of different players. I think that'll be the main, we'll probably do maybe four more of these short little ones. But I think that at least with the, you know, with the whistle a small little bit kind of gets you going, ah, just, I'll make a few notes there. That that sounds like, I, yeah, I'll sound like I know what I'm talking about at least when it comes to uh, 50, 20, the kicks and stuff like that, that. These seem to be the ones that just seem to puzzle people whenever I run into them. You know, you hear, like we do, if you listen to an episode before, where we had uh, Putty, <laughs> the Putty episode and the Rog episode. These were the sort of fellas that are shouting from from the terraces who, God bless them, they didn't listen to an episode of a podcast like ours where we're explaining not to sound like an absolute clangor down the pub or in the terraces. At least you'll know, you'll know kind of what you're talking about anyway. Uh, till the next one. Um, I've been Tom O'Mahony. I've been Banana Capeless. Yes, you have. Uh, Ihawa. Slán all ya. The Banana and Bear.